And George Orwell, who I was glad you mentioned, um, uh, was very vigilant about this in his work on politics and the English language and thought there was a real relationship, important, intimate relationship between language, truth, and logic. And you can notice when people have completely decoupled language from its meaning, and it's often to do with mixture of metaphor, so that again from Proud to Rotas, you would hear um, the jackboot has been thrown into the melting pot. Um, the fascist octopus has sung its swan song. <laughs> and things of this kind, where it was perfectly clear that it was just quacking now, barking. And that's the origin of, that's the origin of Newspeak. I'm going to come back to Newspeak. I'm going to, I'm going to end on it if I'm, if, I get, if I'm allowed to go that far. Um, Auden, W.H. Auden made a, uh, the same intuitive connection in um, 1968 when the armies of the Warsaw Pact occupied Czechoslovakia. He wrote a very short poem from just across the border in Kirkstetten in Austria because he saw the propaganda that, that had been used to justify this atrocity. It's a provocation against... Uh, the existence of the Czechoslovak regime was a provocation against the Soviet Union. Uh, it, uh, those who thought otherwise were banging the drum for the Cold War. It, all of these terrible long by expressions. And um, he wrote a short poem. It's called August 1968, and it goes like this. Um, the ogre does what ogres can. Deeds quite impossible for man. But one prize is beyond his reach. The ogre cannot master speech. <laughs> About a subjugated plane, <clears throat> amid the terrorized and the slain, the ogre stalks with hands on hips while drivel gushes from his lips. It was the perfect encapsulation of the, the long Dubois and its relationship to aggression and totalitarianism. And it's a very nice, it's better than an irony of history, it's a real vindication that only 21 years later, uh, the Czechoslovak people freed themselves from this regime without anyone losing even a fingernail, without a shot being fired in a movement led by poets and dramatists and essayists and Ironists who simply by folding their arms and mocking the system made it go away like, like the kingdom of Oz. This is the high stakes that we play for. This is why it is funny, but it's also very serious. Now, um, before I <clears throat> finish, because I know I'm the one who's standing, sitting actually, between you and the panel, um, I think there are some other things we ought to be very strongly uh, aware of. Um, the worst is euphemism, I suppose. Again, Orwell was very tight on this and very hard. Euphemism, in other words, the invention of pretty words for nasty things. Sometimes we win a round or two here. I don't think any politician would any longer describe civilian casualties as collateral damage. They used to. I don't think they would dare to do that now. I think we won that one. But what is currently annoying me the most is the use of the word abuse to describe the rape and torture and molestation of underage children. It's not abuse. <laughs> abuse is what I do to Johnny Walker Black Label. <laughs> it's, a, it's a victimless crime to, well, to some extent. <laughs> looking, for, looking for an easy and excusing word for rape and torture and molestation of children is itself a crime and actually abets the crime and makes it seem as if there's no case to answer except that of sin and repentance instead of what is really necessary now, which is law and, most important word of all, justice. So let's have no more of that. And let's have our press stop using this crummy word to describe this terrible situation. Um, I think that the reporting of poll data, as if it was news, newspapers, when they can't be bothered to research anything or do any work, commission an opinion poll and then report its findings as if it was front page news already by itself. That's bad, and it leads to crummy expressions like approval rating. Why do we allow a word like approval rating to circulate? I remember seeing a poll in the Los Angeles Times at the moment when Ronald Reagan had, you may remember this, a cancerous polyp in his bottom. Up his ass, to be exact. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's not be... Well, the readers of the Los Angeles Times were invited to in opinion poll to, to say, did they think that this polyp would A, be safely surgically removed, <laughs> B, would come back, or C, would go into remission? So everyone was consulted as if they were experts on the state of affairs <laughs> in the president's rear end. This is, this is stupid, and the polling, 
the pull data language of consensus that goes with it, I think, is very stupid too. And it's a substitute for news. It's a substitute for research, for reporting, for analysis. It's junk and needs to be uh, denounced as such. Um, the word radical to me is a precious word. It has a, a very honorable history in the, in the romantic movement of the 19th century and in many movements associated with it. I think it's worth preserving. I don't want to hear that the scrofulous cler cleric Mr. al in Yemen is a radical cleric when he's talking about a return to the Middle Ages, doing without the services and talents of all women, um, talking about the, the torture and killing of homosexuals and the random infliction of violence on civilians. He should be called the reactionary cleric al not the radical one. It robs the language of a word if we uh, carry on in this way. Uh, the word community pisses me off. <laughs> Who isn't in a community now? It, it's particularly bad in my, my adopted uh, country and in, in my hometown of Washington, D.C. There's the, um, the defense community, all right, if you must. The intelligence community for the CIA is an outrage. <clears throat> <laughs> The donor community, for those who seek to influence politics by giving money under the table, is appalling. Um, and the ultimate uh, reductio ad absurdum of it, I did actually once read in a very guardedly written account of organized crime, um, the Sicilian business community. Um, <clears throat> you hear the word community, keep your hand on your wallet. Uh, Tragedy is another word that with, I think one cannot function without, and is a word of which the language must not be robbed. Uh, there are two definitions of tragedy. One is the, uh, the Hegelian one. I think there was, is, this is the most acute. The tragedy is when two rights come into conflict, when there's an apparently irreconcilable combat between two rights. That's a tragic situation. And there's the Greek uh, one, the, the Sophoclean, the Euripidean one of... Uh, Tragedy being the fatal flaw in a great person, the one that, the one that will undo him, that will set his purposes at naught. Um, these are important considerations. Uh, they're morally important, and they're dramatically important. They're aesthetically important. Tragedy is not when disco-going princess has tra tra a traffic accident. <laughs> That's not tragedy. Um, it may be an unhappy business, but it's not tragedy. And the, uh, the use of vicarious identification, in other words, wearing green ribbons about people we, or yellow ones, but people we don't know, uh, a waste of feeling, a waste of emotion on, 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 on vicarious identification, is another sickly, euphemistic seduction into which the media continually uh, lure us. Well, I've got some other examples too, but we'll save all that for the time when it's your turn. I just would close with Orwell... Um, as well, if you, if you finish 1984, when you've finished it, you'll, you'll find that there's a, an, an appendix by the author. It's a, called A Dictionary of Newspeak. It's, it's only a few pages, but the, the idea of Newspeak is to make certain thoughts unutterable, especially any thoughts of freedom, so there will be no word for it. And so that certain, it isn't that certain thoughts or opinions would be banned, is that they could not, in language, in English, be formulated. And for a counterexample, uh, Orwell gives, uh, cites a sentence that couldn't be rendered into Newspeak, for which there could be no Newspeak translation. And it goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with certain inalienable rights, and so on. Well, long may that remain untranslatable into any long Dubois, and let us all strive to stand by not just the language, but the freedom, uh, the democracy, the aspiration, the beauty, and the dignity to which uh, we are entitled as a birthright. Thank you. Uh, something that you talked about, Nathan, which was authenticity and the need to be authentic. I, I often uh, feel rather depressed when I watch an interview like Kerry O'Brien on the 7.30 report, and, and it becomes a game. It becomes a kind of a, a carefully framed question to try and trap out a politician, um, and, and so that, to be safe, and you mentioned risk-free, that's uh, what generates this kind of language. 
And it, in the end, I think, well, I've just listened for that to, to, for 10 minutes and it really it generated nothing of value for public debate. And, and I guess I'd like to ask both, uh, well, all, all, all three of you, if you have a comment on it, what can we do to try and cut through that, to actually get more authenticity in that exchange uh, so that we can have a, a, a more open and democratic discussion? Well, yeah, look, I, I think one of the problems with, the, with the, the news cycle speeding up as insanely as it currently is, is that um, we now have silence all the time that has to be filled with something. And, and whether it's polls that are commissioned and then reported upon, um, or whether it's um, constant doorstops. I mean, as Premier, I guess you were doing it one a day. Um, Tony Blair at the end of his term, gave a, a, a quite a, a fascinating, aggressive, a bit hypocritical speech about the media, um, where he talked about the savagery of the of, of the media. Uh, he talked about the media being like a feral beast, destroying everything in its path. Now, I think it's a tiny bit tricky coming from Tony Blair, a man who early in his term entered the North, North Island peace talks and said, this is not a time for sound bites. I feel the hand of history upon my shoulder. <laughs> but, <you> know, <laughs> So, you know, fair go, but um, for the shake of the sauce bottle or, or whatever. Um, Who was suck of the sauce? Well, that's the thing. It, it's actually it supposed to be right. suck, yeah. you know, as Martin Amos wrote to, you know, to, a, a, to attempt so little by way of expression and yeah. still to fuck that up, you know. Um, but, you know, it, it's a, um, it's, it's, uh, a problem um, of needing to generate matter and content. And I think that because we see our politicians all the time, we're constantly checking in on them. We don't let them have time to reflect, to develop an opinion, or even to change their mind on something. I mean, that's something that I think is, is, a, is a bit wrong with the, way, is the, with the way we work. So is the answer to be less available? You know, or to give them time, change the formats of the interviewing and the, and, and the, uh, the television and the radio that they do. I just don't think that's you it. You can try that. Mm. It'll be reported as missing in action. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, there's a, one of the fundamental differences in the way we approach language, if, if you're a journo or, or a politician, is we, we, we have to provide a response on the spot. We don't get the chance to recraft a, a, a sentence in... in, in Although well, you'd like to in your speeches and so on, sometimes, but that means that there's a there's an immediacy to it that uh, you, know, you will not always know the answer to the question. You will not always uh, uh, remember that you did something six months ago or made a remark six months ago that may now be dissonant, um, and that's just part of the gig. Um, as annoying as it is when you get hung up on it, it's it's that's just part of the gig. I don't know a way around it other than other than when you do make an error, front up, say, listen, I got that wrong. Uh, here, here's the circumstance in which I got it wrong, and that's why, but this is, the, this, is, this is the case now. Now, you know, you'll be smashed for that, but it's probably better to do that uh, than over time um, be denying or, or, or prosecuting the notion that you're infallible. It's just not nonsense. I would start with my own profession, which I think is, is almost the most culpable. I'll give you an example. Oddly, it comes from the same election that Philip Adams called me about at that time. It was 92. George Bush was the president of the United States. And the, the Republican nomination for the governorship of Louisiana had been won by a man called David Duke, who some of you may remember, who was a former head of the Ku Klux Klan and of the American Nazi Party. So the president was asked at a press conference in the White House in the executive mansion itself, how do you feel about the, the flag of your party being carried in a major state by a Nazi and a Klansman. And his reply was, I can always quote it from memory, he said, well, I'd like to be positioned where I can be perceived as having been distanced from that. <laughs> and, and everybody wrote that down loyally because, the, the, we, okay, we can check that box, that's the right answer. He should be perceived as being distanced from this. And he gave the right, but he didn't do anything actually to earn the perception or the distancing or the positioning, but it was the right answer, so it got written down. Okay, we can, he, that, was, that was fine. Didn't have to prove any more. This is terrible. John Kerry is somewhere in Sydney now. I don't know if any of you have been to any of his panels. He wrote a wonderful introduction to an anthology of journalism for the OUP about 25 years ago, where he said, the cliche is waiting inside the typewriter, or we would now say the keyboard. It's waiting there. Cliches, as you know, should be avoided like the plague. 
<laughs> they're always lurking. And they're, they're in the keyboard, and the journalist's fingers touch the keyboard, and the cliché, sensing this, goes into the fingers and has up the arms, <laughs> into the brain, and then down onto the page. It's there. So you find you've written that the man who not only married the most beautiful woman in the world, but also won the Nobel Prize and the Pulitzer um, in the same year, was, uh, had, had no mean achievement. <laughs> it's written itself for you. It was already there, waiting. <laughs> and so you, you can become perceived as having distanced yourself from... <laughs> This is, the, it's, it's, it's not even thinking badly, it's refusing to think at all. Um, that's the problem. And I, I think my profession is the one that's most responsible for it. Of course, Orwell used that metaphor of uh, the prefabricated hen house, mm. that you use words and you don't think about it, or as Annabelle was saying, they could be constructed in any order. Yes. You just let them do the thinking for yeah. you. Uh, the future lies before us, um, the past behind... Um, we must light the torch of knowledge at the fountain of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> it writes itself. Or, or, or that Australian cl classic, we've got to get the status quo back to the way it was before. <laughs> <laughs> now, we should, we should go to your questions. Over on the right here, please. Yes. Um, I'm a journalist, and one of the most frustrating things I experience is when I um, have an article published, such as one that was printed yesterday, um, my editor will make changes to it that sort of soften some of the language. So, for example, yesterday I wrote about homophobia and mentioned the Westboro Baptist Church in America who uh, have banners saying God hates fags and AIDS cures fags. And I used those examples in the article, but the editor changed it to anti-gay banners. So I guess my question to you is, do you think at all there is a space in the media for dumbing down language or for softening language? Like, for example, with swear words, if we're quoting someone, let's say it's the word shit, they'll put S, asterisk, 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 when we all know what the word is, so why don't we just write it? So that's my question to you. Is there a place for the softening and the dumbing down of language? Because I don't feel there is, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Perhaps, uh, that's, <laughs> that reminds me, we were just discussing what I consider to be the most evil and brilliant put-down of a sub-editor um, and... Please, yes. I don't associate myself with this sentiment because my sub-editors always save me from hideous debacles. But Clive James is rep reputed to have, in the correspondence with a sub-editor, used the line, uh, listen, if I wrote like that, I'd be you. Which is, um, <laughs> Keep that one burnished and by it. <laughs> This is how language um, gets the, the, the edges knocked off it or, or, or gets banged out of shape, isn't it? It passes through a succession of people, each of whom think that their own understanding of what is appropriate language is, is superior to uh, his or her predecessor, I suppose. And that's what you've been a victim of yesterday. Uh, good luck with your next piece for that, that um, publication. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's that sort of running interference that, that, that alters language. And when, it, uh, when it's undertaken by uh, great numbers of people, that's when language itself changes. It's not always a bad thing, just a sort of a, can be quite a spooky thing. Your thoughts? Well, it's the same, it's the same problem as of euphemism. And people thinking that if they, if they could find a way of softening the blow, in other words, you're not, you're not crippled, you're physically challenged for example, or you're no longer a Negro, but you're an African-American. And I actually do know of a sub editor who, who changed um, a headline and was in a Boston paper saying, state budget back in the African-American. <laughs> because all he knew was there were certain things not to do. Uh, and he doggedly did what the star book said. Um, What's going to happen there is, a, is actually a rather cruel outcome. People, the words physically challenged will become sarcastic. They will themselves become the thing you can't say because that's the way of being nasty about someone who's a gimmick or a crip. Um, but the, 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 wish to, the wish to do this, to bring this about, it, must, it, it, it has to do with the combat between the, the Colosseum of the superego and the, and the id, the wish to censor ourselves uh, and to euphemize things is, is, is very deep in us all. And it needs to be looked into individually and very carefully rooted out. And a uh, question over here. 
I think the, the goal of political speech, um, political language, um, should be to simplify without being simplistic. But that's very difficult in the days of the five second sound grab and 140 character limit on Twitter. I think uh, Keating said it best when he said that if Abraham Lincoln made the Gettys Gettysburg Address today, it wouldn't be reported in full. The journalists would wait for the doorstop and take a one-liner from it. The question really is, how do you explain something like an emissions trading scheme or foreign policy of Australia for the next 20 years when our attention span has been so reduced by the use of things like Twitter, emails, uh, text messages, all of these um, devices that really, if not dumb us down, at least curtail the use of good language. I might direct that one to you. Um, yes. Nathan, well, I think your experience I think that's of explaining complexity. Actually, complexity. that's a comment, isn't it? Not a question. <laughs> and a very good one. But it's... it's, it's uh, that is probably the great difficulty in, in modern political life, how you have a, a sensible policy debate, often about something complex. We've just had a probably the most far-reaching debate on health reform that I can recall. I'm 42. Uh, I don't recall the debates around uh, Medicare, uh, or Medibank, as it was in 75, in the 70s. But uh, the paradox is that there is more information out there than ever before for people to access if they are interested in the policy area. But you take health reform, uh, the takeout from that is lots of money and a change to government structures. Now, beneath those two uh, key outcomes or, 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 or key shifts, I don't know precisely what's going to happen at the state level that's going to help you get your knee fixed or your hip fixed later on. I don't know. Uh, and I suspect most people don't. We rely on engendering interest in a policy area, uh, pointing people to a website often and saying, this is where all the information is that you're going to need. And, uh, uh, it's, you know, people have thousands of messages bombarding them each day. Uh, you all know that. Uh, the uh, working families know it particularly well. Um, <laughs> they've got the rear of family, pay the rent, pay the mortgage, and at some point, when they get a bit of spare time, take an interest in these things that we all think matter. Well, uh, that's hard. It, uh, it seems to me that, I guess, once upon a time, if, if you read something that was written, um, it, it used to be somebody's very carefully considered thoughts. Whereas now there is an immediacy for just about everybody. This is not just a case of perhaps you know, CEOs or, or politicians or, or whatever uh, publishing or having you know, their thoughts or policies made known, but, but just everybody uh, in the general community is able to express the first thing that comes into their head uh, anywhere, anytime. Uh, and, and not just in the public realm, but just, I guess, just generally, um, and this might be a, a question that, that a, perhaps a professor of linguistics may be able to best answer, is, 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 is playing English amongst the community getting worse, and is, is technology uh, partly responsible for that? It might be interesting to throw that to Annabelle, because you're one of the early adopters of Twitter in your Twitter cast from Parliament. What, did, mm. what are your thoughts about technology and, and the use of, um, the use of uh, social media like Twitter? Well, I'm all for it because it allows you to talk to an audience of people who self-select themselves as being interested in what you're saying. I mean, I, I think that's the, the great advantage of Twitter for, 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 for journalists, um, and political journalists in particular. You know that you're not boring a general audience, you know. But, I, you know, there's, there's different types of, of writing and, and different types of communication, I think. Um, I, I think that political language, political oratory in particular, needs to have an enormous amount of work put into it. It shouldn't be lazy speech. It shouldn't be just cliches that you grab out of the air. I mean, a proper speech, a proper speech that creates a shortcut to a political end, a, a, a proper speech that changes people's minds or, or, or makes them... Um, consider something in a new light, has to have an enormous amount of work put into it. And a finished piece of writing is like that too. And I think that um, uh, it's worth remembering the difference between off-the-cuff kind of communications such as those that are encouraged by Twitter or Facebook or whatever and, you know, your ability to um, be acquainted with exactly the kind of donut that your friend in, in um, San Francisco is presently enjoying or whatever. Um, but... Uh, a proper piece of writing, a proper enterprise that is going to, sh to change minds or make people think is, is a real piece of work. And, and I think we need to remember that. Can I just add to that? 
I mean, that, that's true. And I'm happy, happy, happy to admit that I've used speechwriters. Um, <laughs> because the reality is that if you're trying to write a good speech, the, I would work on a factor of 10 to 1. For every hour that you're going to speak, it's going to take you 10 hours to put the speech together. You've got speechwriters. For the most important speeches, you take a very heavy hand in it yourself. And in fact, you write much of it. Uh, but you are literally sometimes delivering 10 speeches a day. You don't physically have the time to write the speeches, so you have to rely on that sort of resource. It was interesting that you uh, mentioned um, party leaderships and politicians and CEOs in the same breath, I think, because another means by which this weed has spread so far and, and entrenched itself so well is by the idea that the coverage of politics is to do with with branding and rebranding. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we all accept that as we do rollouts. So suppose I was to be having dinner with one of you, you wish. <laughs> and and, and it, was, it would be like this. I'd say, would well, try this. Can I pour you some of that? And send it to a witchy with a few limericks. Um, things. And then then I, inter I interrupt myself and say, by the way, I've been striving to make a good impression on you all evening. Would you mind telling me now if this is working or not? <laughs> because if it isn't, I'll have to try some other bloody tactic. You would think you were having dinner with a psycho. <laughs> but, but with the party leadership abetted by the media, they keep saying, well, how is the rebranding going, Mr. Cameron? Do you think you've succeeded in presenting yourself as less of a toff and more of a man of the people or not? So that's a very good question. I was going to ask you how well I was doing in that precise way. <laughs> This is, this is cretinism, and it's, and it's very, very, very widespread, and, it, and it's borrowed from a business model that is consciously designed to deceive and indeed to th rob people, and it's accepted as if it was as natural as breathing. And again, I, I hold my own profession the most culpable in this. Politicians can't be blamed if we are at their feet and at their disposal in that way. Rebranding forsooth. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we have run out of time, um, and uh, I'm sure we no. could go for <laughs> at least another hour, hour and a half, and keep kicking this around. But uh, as we started with a quote from Kevin Rudd, we may as well finish with a quote from Kevin Rudd. <laughs> oh, no, I've got one. I've got one. Okay. Does anyone here remember Jimmy Hoffa, yes. the head of the Teamsters Union? They're still looking for him. He went, he went away a long time ago. He was taken for a ride by the Sicilian business community. And it is believed that his last resting place is in the span of an arch of a freeway in um, the central New Jersey area. And his son, young James, ran for the leadership of the Teamsters Union a few years ago um, and looked likely to win. And he was asked at a press conference what his hopes and ambitions were. And he said, I'd like to follow in my father's footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, will you please thank our panellists, Nathan Rees, Annabelle Crabb, and Camille Dupont.